Um, and it is my uh, great pleasure um, and honor to introduce to you our panel today and to um, help manage the discussion. Um, uh, we have three distinguished speakers. I will introduce them in the order in which we uh, decided it would make most sense for them to speak. Um, we will hear first from Andreas Paulos, uh, who is a, a, a professor at the University of Göttingen um, and since 2010 uh, a member of the German Constitutional Court uh, in the first Senate uh, which um, deals with fundamental rights questions under the German Constitution. Um, Andreas, I'll keep these things short, uh, but I'll tell you a little bit. And Andreas uh, received his PhD and his habilitation uh, from the University of Munich. Um, actually, his advisor was uh, Bruno Sima, who will be receiving the Manley Hudson Award uh, today um, at the luncheon. Um, he also served as co-counsel in the famous Lagrange case. Um, and I should say, Andreas is uh, the um, has, has has a rare distinction of someone who writes about both national parliamentarism and the development of the international community in international law. And so it's sort of quite interesting um, to hear uh, to hear him speak about these two different, uh, sometimes opposing uh, polls. Um, next, we will hear from uh, Pete Eckert, um, who is a professor of European Union law at UCL Faculty of Law in, in London. Um, and also a member of Matrix Chambers, which we all know. Um, and he, before joining the UCL, he was a director of uh, the European uh, law program uh, at uh, King's College in London. Um, he received his PhD and his law degree from the University of Ghent in Brussels. Um, and he also served as legal advisor to Advocate General Jacobs at the European Court of Justice in Luxembourg, where we first met uh, many years ago. Um, Pete Eckert is an expert um, and authority on external relations and also on international economic law. Uh, he's written an important uh, textbook uh, or uh, what, treatise on uh, international, uh, on European uh, external relations. Uh, finally, we will hear from uh, Inita Zimela, who's a judge on the European uh, Court of Human Rights. Um, she's also a professor of law at the Riga Graduate School of Law. Um, she has uh, studied um, and uh, worked uh, in England, in the United States, um, and elsewhere. Uh, she received her PhD from the University of Cambridge um, and uh, founded the Center for Human Rights at the University of Latvia. Um, and she has written uh, many books and many, many articles uh, from things ranging from state succession to minority rights and human rights. Um, so please join me in welcoming our panel and we will hear first from Andreas Paulos for about 15 minutes to 20 minutes each. Um, I might say a couple of words after that and then we'll open it up uh, to discussion. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, uh, Daniel. Um, and thank you very much to Laurie and you to invite me here. It's very nice to come back to the American society after four years. Uh, the past three years I was so busy at Karlsruhe that I couldn't come here. Um, and it's amazing I've heard that the new world and the old world have uh, more or less the same amount of customers. Um, some of uh, the audience uh, is actually from Europe. That is how it is. Things are these days. You have to come to America to meet your European friends. Anyway, um, I'm very happy to be here and I will try to combine my two hats, so to speak, my international law hat and my constitutional court hat by talking to you about this developing human rights world in Europe. Um, what has this to do with uh, European foreign relations? You will learn this at the end when I will talk about, again, about the Cardi case. Some of you will not be uh, very keen to hear even more about that case, but it is still not closed. And I will try to give some new perspective, some, if you like, domestic constitutional perspective on that international case. Um, the combination of many similar but nevertheless distinct systems of human rights protection has led to the emergence of an informal European network of constitutional courts that also encompasses the European Court of Justice in Luxembourg, the EU court, so to speak, and the European Court of Human Rights in Strasbourg. Um, Inita, uh, of course, knows much more about this than me. Um, the president of my court speaks of a European Verfassungsgerichtsverbund, um, it's very German and it is uh, untranslatable, uh, but uh, <laughs> European network, uh, network of European constitutional or highest courts will probably fit best what is meant by this term. Well, of course, uh, to have so many instances for human rights protection is not only a virtue, 
Uh, it is also a vice, it can be a vice for the citizen who tries to find his or her right um, and to find the correct jurisdiction to adjudicate his or her rights. Um, and in addition to that, it's very difficult, of course, also to find a common standard for the 27 states members of the European Union and even more so for the 47 state parties to the European Convention on Human Rights. For an American audience, of course, you have 50 states and that is difficult enough. But uh, don't forget, uh, those other those 50 states may think so, but they are not sovereign in the full international law sense of the term, whereas uh, those 27 or 47 members, respectively, very much believe that they are sovereign. And of course, my own court has pointed this out very clearly, uh, and uh, not really succinctly, but uh, very extensively <laughs> in the Lisbon uh, judgment. So actually, the inter interplay of those different but related legal systems of human rights protection um, are, um, will be part, need to be part of a comprehensive, more or less comprehensive framework uh, that allows the citizen to find his or her right and to find protection. In two decisions of the past uh, two years or so, uh, in the Honeywell decision and in the security detention judgment, uh, the Federal Constitutional Court has clarified the conditions under the German constitution that allow for the implementation of the judgments from Luxembourg and Strasbourg in the German constitutional order. However, the court also developed limits to the implementation of European law in the domestic legal order. Since the entry into force of the Lisbon Treaty in 2009, with the concomitant bindingness of the Charter of Fundamental Rights of the European Union, the relationship between domestic constitutional courts and the Luxembourg court has become even more complex, let alone the very difficult question of the membership of the European Union in the European Court of Human Rights system, of which I'm not going to speak. The German Federal Constitutional Court has always looked for ways to harmonize European constitutional requirements as far as possible by fitting the European obligations into the German constitutional order. At the, at the same time, the court has striven to closely circumscribe the limitations of this procedure. Let me now first talk about the European Convention on Human Rights because to make things more complicated, the two systems of European human rights protection have different effects on the domestic legal order. The European Convention on Human Rights is an international treaty, an international treaty, however, which is directly applicable within the German domestic order. This is not true for all member states of the European Convention on Human Rights, however. Um, so actually it is a normal treaty and as in the United States, ordinary legislation can override treaties in Germany. But that is only half of the story. In fact, in Germany it's less than half of the story. In the United States maybe it's 75% of the story. We also have a charming Betsy doctrine in Germany that is we presume that parliamentary legislation does not want to abrogate Germany's obligations under international treaties, in particular under the European Convention on Human Rights. And in, our, in the Constitution, Article 1, Paragraph 2, there is specific reference to universal human rights, and the court has extended this to the human rights protection by the European Convention on Human Rights. So that actually the lex posterior doctrine is usually does not apply, except uh, if Parliament has explicitly or implicitly said so, and it never does so with regard to the European Convention. So actually, um, usually later legislation will not prevent the application of the European Convention in the interpretation of the European Court of Human Rights in Germany. So we extend this uh, effect also to the um, jurisprudence to the case, cases decided by the European Court of Human Rights. Uh, we call the, we give those judgments as we call it an orientierung and Leitfunktion and normative guidance on our jurisprudence, even on our understanding of our own constitutional protections. Nevertheless, there is the potential for split uh, because, as I said, in theory, the Constitution is primary, not only in theory, also in practice, if you like, is primary to the uh, guarantees under the European Convention on Human Rights. Uh, and also, of course, the standards are similar but different. And that means that we have to, when we want to implement the European Convention and the domestic legal order, we have to understand our own constitution in a way which uh, harmonizes it with 
uh, the Strasbourg case law. Uh, and as the court has pointed out, schematic parallelizations have to be avoided. What rather is required is a fitting in of the European uh, case law in the domestic legal order, which actually is a full, a complete legal order. However, I would suggest that this fitting in, uh, modifying certain uh, claims of certain uh, decisions uh, so that it fits into the German legal world, so to speak, uh, is not enough. Um, it also requires this fitting in procedure, also requires that the European Court of Human Rights itself uh, realizes that uh, it has to give certain leeway to states, and actually it does so by applying the margin of appreciation doctrine. And recently, in the Brighton Declaration, member states have said that they want to put the margin of appreciation for the domestic implementation uh, into the preamble of the European Convention on Human Rights. Of course, margin of appreciation doesn't mean that um, the domestic uh, jurisdictions can modify the judgments in any way. It also only means that the court itself realizes that it needs to leave leeway to states. Sometimes uh, the Laozi judgment has become famous uh, crucifixes in schools, where the European Court of Human Rights let uh, states decide whether they want to do this. Um, sometimes we have the feeling, domestic jurisdictions have the feeling that the margin is lip service and in the end the balancing of the rights concerned is then done in a complete way by the Strasbourg Court. There is a particular line of cases dealing with, uh, on the one hand, uh, the freedom of the press and on the other hand, the right to privacy of important persons uh, most of those cases are called Caroline of Hanover or Monaco. Uh, she may even be known in the United States. Um, and actually, actually, she has, uh, I, I, we have to say that, it's not so easy for people of public interest, let's, let's say, uh, to really see their cases through. Uh, and she did so and actually has done quite a service to both the European and the domestic system. I think now both Courts, uh, the, the European Court has now said that actually the balancing of the two elements is for domestic courts, but has also developed a framework in which this balancing takes place. I only would suggest that in one case, the Springer case, the court has then proceeded to do the stuff itself. It had just left to the margin of appreciation in the paragraphs beforehand. That's of course not the way domestic constitutional courts uh, love to see the judgments from Strasbourg. Anyway, that's the way we deal with the Strasbourg judgments. Um, things are different with the European Court of Justice of the European Union, and that has to do with the quite different relationship of the two legal orders. The uh, legal order of the European Convention is a classical, if you like, international law framework, which then is modified <coughs> to a court for human rights. Uh, but we cover the same ground. The domestic constitutional courts and the Strasbourg system cover the same ground, and that means that Strasbourg has to be laid back a little bit. Um, to leave leeway to the domestic implementation. With the European Union system, it's different um, because in theory there is a clear separation of spheres, so to speak. In its own spheres, the European Union legal order is complete and binding, and it is even it has the so-called Anwendungsvorrang, it has primacy and direct effect. Direct effect is also with the European Convention on Human Rights, but primacy is uh, unique to the European Union system, so it is directly applied to the domestic legal order regardless of the domestic legal system, even regardless, so the European Court of Justice says, uh, of the domestic constitutions. And indeed, um, for instance, the German legal order in Article 23 of the Constitution accepts in the interpretation of uh, the Constitutional Court direct effect and supremacy of the European Union legal order. However, the article also contains limits. For instance, the European Union needs to remain faithful to democracy and the rule of law, and more difficult to the quite extensive German conception of uh, what it means to have human and fundamental rights, and also very difficult to some sort of federalism and subsidiarity, but that's a topic I'm not going to talk in depth today. To how to cope with those different stops or limitations to the direct effect and supremacy in the, dom in the domestic constitutional order. Um, well, the court has developed in the latest, at the latest in the Lisbon judgment, but also before, three counts, so to speak, in which those limitations become real. The first is the famous so lange, so long as jurisprudence, according to which the European Court of Justice 
uh, needs to uphold minimum standards of protection of fundamental rights in the EU legal order itself so that the domestic legal order can trust in the effective implementation of human rights in the European legal order. Uh, this was very important at the beginning, uh, but since, at the latest since the Charter of Fundamental Rights of the European Union, which in fact in some of the rights is even uh, uh, more uh, uh, extensive than the uh, German legal order, um, I would say that the so long as jurisprudence has a little bit taken a step back, uh, we will come back to it, however, when we analyze the relationship to the Security Council and to the UN legal order. Um, the second count has become more important, it is the so-called ultra-virus jurisprudence, and of course international lawyers know ultra-virus, in fact, from arbitration, when an arbitral court, in the early days at least, of arbitration had overstepped its competences, a state could um, decide not to follow its case law. Um, the ultra-virus jurisprudence, so our court has said, is also applies to the European Court of Justice. And that, of course, has a huge potential for conflict. However, the court has, um, in, later, in the later times, um, in the Honeywell judgment of two years ago, made clear that declaring judgments of the European Court of Justice ultra-virus is the exception rather than the rule. It means that the European Court of Justice can develop its own means of interpretation, it can develop further the European uh, Union legal order, and our court has first, before it declares um, invalid or inapplicable, invalid it cannot, uh, declares inapplicable European court, court judgments in Germany, uh, it first needs to refer the matter to the European Court of Justice. And in fact, those conditions have uh, resulted in the effect that until now no such case of uh, explicit ultra-virus jurisprudence has arisen. However, um, this is not necessarily so for eternity. The most problematic count probably is the, first, is the third one. It is the so-called count of constitutional identity, according to which uh, judgments which would violate the constitutional identity of Germany in all its openness towards uh, the European legal order if it goes beyond the limits of the minimum requirements of the German constitutional order, um, then uh, such judgments could be invalid, uh, could not be applicable in the domestic legal order of Germany. This identity jurisprudence could also only arise probably because the European uh, treaties have an explicit um, reference to the respect of domestic constitutional identity. Um, and therefore, those three counts have so far largely remained theoretical um, rather than practical. Where they can become practical, however, is in general with regard to the relationship between difficult, different uh, legal orders. And now I come to my third point uh, regarding the transfer of this jurisprudence to the European relationship, European Union relationship with uh, the international legal world. And I come to the Cardi case, which of course deals with the terror listing practice of the United Nations Security Council. Um, the case is uh, there for quite some time. Um, in its second rendition, um, it waits for the, the final decision of in this year. Um, however, if you look at this case, you find elements of all those three counts, if you like, um, which the Constitutional Court in Germany has developed. We find the Account of constitutional identity. Advocate General Maduro made it very clear in the first Cardi case that he was of the opinion uh, that um, constitutional identity of the European Union required that um, the terror lists must be completely checked by the European Court of Justice. There was not much room for um, accepting the Security Council assessment of who was to be listed and who was not. The court did not quite follow suit, but it wasn't quite clear whether it had accepted that constitutional identity argument. The argument was that the rights enshrined in the European Union treaties would trump everything which would come from the Security Council. More recently, however, other advocates general, Juliana Kokot in a publication and now Advocate General Bott in actually the second Cardi case, have suggested that actually there may be more of a so long an argument, so long as argument in the European Court of Justice deciding about terror listings, in other word, words, as long as the UN has not developed 
uh, an effective system of protection of those terrorists people uh, itself, uh, the European Court of Justice would have to step in. On the other hand, Advocate General Bott has said, uh, due to recent developments, he is of the opinion that the Court of Justice could take back some of those controls in the second rendition now. My own position um, is quite similar actually to one developed by our chair today and uh, the late Eric Stein, which have pointed out that actually admitting the results of a foreign legal order within your own means that you first have to acknowledge what this other legal order is doing, so long as does this and to a certain extent. Um, but it would also mean that you analyze whether or not those Security Council resolutions uh, and the terror listings themselves are um, observing the standards comp uh, contained in the UN Charter itself. And there you can have sincere doubts when, the, when you regard Article 1 and the promotion of human rights in the UN legal order. I don't want to go into detail on this now, but I would suggest that those three counts developed by the German Constitutional Court can also be made fruitful for the relationship between other legal orders and the judgments uh, of and the um, effects of other legal orders uh, um, in between themselves. By way of conclusion, let me say that the word lawfare, which appears also in uh, the introduction uh, words to the, our panel, uh, in Europe seems to be characterized not by some kind of imp European imperialism, but more uh, by overlapping jurisdictions and by the development of tools for their fruitful relationship among each other. But the main task, and that is very firm uh, with our court and also I think with the European Court of Human Rights, and it remains to be emphasized again, is that all of the different systems need to ensure an effective protection of the rights of individual citizens, regardless of the competent court, but also regardless of the domestic or international origin of the law in question. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Daniel, and um, thank you to the organizers for inviting me to speak today uh, on this uh, panel on the European Union as a global actor in a multipolar world. Um, I wasn't expecting Andreas to talk about Cardi, but Cardi is unavoidable, and having spent uh, now many years on, on the part of Mr. Cardi's team, I will, uh, for a minute or two, refrain from commenting any further, but um, I cannot imagine not saying anything about it at some stage later on. I will try to edge a little bit closer to the outline of what our panel is supposed to discuss today, not necessarily to answer all the questions. Um, the last one, uh, it struck Andreas and it struck me as well, maybe I can say something about that, is all this mere lawfare and an op obnoxious hindrance to the US as the indispensable power of this world, <laughs> I'm al almost tempted to say I should hope so. Um, I should say I did not draft that. <laughs> <laughs> yes, no, none of us did actually. <laughs> um, but I do want to speak a, a little bit further about the current legal landscape of European uh, foreign policy, particularly uh, post the Lisbon Treaty, which has uh, amended the European Union founding treaties in a quite considerable way, particularly in relation to the EU's uh, external action or foreign policies. And the thesis I want to uh, put forward is that what we are witnessing in this uh, uh, developing European foreign policy is also a process of constitutionalization of European foreign policy. Now, what do, what do I mean by European foreign policy? It's a bit of a more difficult concept to grasp, I think, than if you're talking about uh, US foreign policy. Uh, it's always very important to remember, of course, that Europe is a non-unitary actor, um, certainly compared to the United States, and this goes beyond interagency fights, of which we have many within the European Union, and the Lisbon Treaty has, in fact, uh, increased the scope for interagency fights by creating an external action service uh, sitting next to the Commission and the Council and of course the Member State foreign offices. Uh, but 
But beyond that, there is, of course, within the European Union and in Europe generally, no final central authority. And from, from a purely uh, legal constitutional perspective, Andreas has talked extensively about, about that, the relationships between legal orders, but also at a political level and in terms of conducting foreign policy. Uh, clearly, there isn't a, a White House which uh, uh, has the final say. Uh, external powers are divided between the European Union and uh, the member states. So what I mean by European foreign policy is quite a broad term. Uh, it's not limited to uh, the attempts which the European Union is now or has been undertaking for a long time to develop something like a common foreign and security policy, uh, still quite fledgling attempts, I think. Uh, but it encompasses all of what the European Union now calls external action, so all of the foreign policies, external policies, including trade and economic policies, environmental policies, um, of which, of course, there are many. Uh, and when you talk about European foreign policy, I think it's not just the EU, it's always, uh, you always have to bring the member states of the European Union into the equation as well, because European policies have an effect on member states, but also very often the member states are kind of structurally involved uh, because they may be members of an international organization of which the EU is not a member, uh, and because the EU uh, may conclude international treaties and agreements together with the member states and may act, try to act together with the member states. Uh, think only of uh, the Copenhagen uh, climate change uh, uh, summit where uh, this attempt for Europe to speak with one voice really really failed, I think, because there were too many actors involved. So that's the concept of European foreign policy I'd like to try to address. Uh, and what do I mean with constitutionalization? Well, um, it's, a, it's a, a very straightforward concept of constitutionalization. I'm not putting forward any particular uh, theory of constitutionalism. Um, I, what I mean is that European foreign policy is increasingly subject to constitutional type disciplines and to constitutional type adjudication and that you have uh, increasingly in this field what I would call constitutionally thick concepts such as uh, division of competences, a principle of uh, loyalty between member states and the European Union, federal loyalty, uh, human rights applied to uh, foreign policy questions and the Cardi case of course is uh, the, um, the main case in, in that area. Now my thesis that there is a process of constitutionalization underway uh, needs some backing up. So I, I mentioned it's not a needs a full paper to really uh, uh, analyze in detail all the elements of this constitutionalization process. But let me mention a few uh, to try to indicate what's happening in Europe. Uh, yesterday, Harold Cole uh, in in a very interesting panel final panel discussion. Uh, on the um, Obama administration's approach to uh, international law, uh, mentioned the importance a couple of times of uh, upholding uh, our values, the United States values, um, democracy, rule of law, respect for human rights, but they're also very much the European Union founding values, of course. Uh, but it was clear to me that this was a, a kind of policy statement, that this was uh, very important. Within the European Union, we have constitutionalized those values in terms of how they apply to uh, the external action of the European Union in a very ambitious way. Um, if you read Article 21 of the Treaty on European Union, uh, just the first paragraph, uh, it says the Union's action on the international scene shall be guided by the principles which have inspired its own creation, development and enlargement and which it seeks to advance in the wider world, democracy, the rule of law, the universality and indivisibility of human rights and fundamental freedoms, respect for human dignity, principles of equality and solidarity, and respect for the principles of the United Nations Charter and international law. And that's just the beginning. If you read uh, the rest of the provision, it goes on and on, uh, indicating uh, what a force for good the European Union intends to be in the world. Now, there's at least one person in the room who uh, likes to call this motherhood and apple pie. Um, and um, it remains to be seen what actually the, the legal and the policy effect of such grand constitutional statements uh, may be. Uh, but I'm a bit more, more optimistic than motherhood and apple pie in the sense that 
the European Union has always been uh, a functional international organization. It's not a sovereign state. It's very much guided by uh, in its actions uh, or seeks to be guided by what these founding treaties set out. And it's also to a large extent guided by legal discipline, uh, the, the, the lawyers within um, within the institutions of the of the European Union always play a very important role and so does the court. The court hasn't said anything about this provision as yet, but it may do so, for example, in the second uh, Cardi case where we are awaiting judgment. There's, as another element of this constitutionalization process, uh, there is an increasing judicialization of European foreign policy. Um, and that's, um, I'm, I'm not sure, I mean, the Again, the Cardi case is just only the tip of the iceberg, um, but the European Union courts are now uh, ever more increasingly faced with, with cases involving essentially foreign policy, namely cases concerning so-called restrictive measures, basically economic sanctions and counter-terrorism sanctions. And there's a, even an, an avalanche of cases before the European courts uh, following from the uh, Arab Spring, uh, cases from uh, uh, countries like Libya, Tunisia, uh, Egypt, uh, Syria also, also from Zimbabwe, and cases in the counter-terrorism context of uh, persons brought by persons and entities who are listed in uh, sanctions measures which the European uh, Union institutions have adopted. Um, and within that uh, judicialization process, of course, there are important questions of what the, the the proper role is of the of the courts to uh, to check the decisions by the political institutions, which are foreign policy decisions, of course. Now, I have to say that so far, uh, within that case law, there have been few signs uh, of anything like a, a political question uh, doctrine, uh, certainly up to Cardi uh, number one, uh, both the General Court of the European Union and the Court of Justice uh, on appeal uh, have uh, very much refrained from looking at these cases in any different way from a, a standard human rights case. Uh, the son of a Burmese uh, uh, businessman is listed uh, by the European Union simply by association because he is presumed to, uh, if his assets are not frozen, his father, who is closely linked to the regime, could use his son to circumvent the sanctions. Uh, well, the European Court says uh, we need some proof uh, as to why you think that that would be uh, a, a realistic scenario and we will look at the human rights, uh, the rights to property of that person in exactly the same way as we would look at it in a purely domestic uh, context. And of course the, the judgment of the European Court of Justice in Cardi number one is the uh, apex of imposing full, full constitutional discipline on a foreign policy act but that's already uh, as was already indicated, um, it remains to be seen what the court will decide in Cardi number two, which is um, in a sense on the more difficult question as to what is the appropriate standard of review in these cases. Uh, are these cases characterized by um, a legal and policy setting which calls for a lesser standard of review? That's very much the uh, opinion of Advocate General Bott in the case. Um, my only comment I will give is that uh, it's a standard of review which is almost meaningless because um, it's sufficient that you get a letter of one page with some allegations um, for you to be listed, uh, or whether the court will uphold um, similar standards of judicial review in this area as you would have purely in a domestic context. Another element of this constitutionalization process is um, the expanding competences of the European Union in, in the field of uh, external policies. Um, common foreign and security policy is a, a bit of a, a rare beast in the sense that uh, it claims to have, um, uh, to, to basically the, the treaties confer full competence on the European Union uh, to act in all areas of foreign policy, but there's a very uh, significant political check on, on those powers in the sense that the European uh, member states and the Council always have to act unanimously uh, in order to adopt foreign policy decisions. So that's not really an area where competences are expanding very much, although in practice it seems like the European Union has discovered 
its voice in foreign policy, particularly in the field in this field of sanctions. Uh, they are really proliferating, and the European Union is playing an important role there. But uh, beyond pure foreign policy in the field of trade, of course, the EU now has powers also in matters of foreign direct investment. Uh, its powers have been uh, increased formally speaking, so as to match all of the WTO territory. Um, and even more importantly, I think uh, th there continues to be, and becomes ever more important, this uh, funny little judgment of 1971 called ERTA, where the European Court said uh, whenever there's EU legislation on a particular matter, where that EU legislation is affected by an international negotiation, uh, the European Union has exclusive competence to participate in that international negotiation because of uh, the effect on, on its uh, internal legislation. I, do, I don't think the European Court anticipated uh, the scope that principle would acquire because the European Union now internally legislates on so many, uh, in so many different policy areas that it's actually very hard to come up with a meaningful uh, international negotiation where you cannot point to some uh, ERTA, uh, ERTA type exclusive competence so the European Union needs to be involved because there's some effect on some directive or, or regulation of the European Union. Um, and what this creates is uh, not necessarily the EU acting alone, it, it's the EU acting with its member states which is a complex uh, um, complex type of non-unitary acting, but it does get the European Union involved in, in so many areas of international lawmaking. Another element of this uh, constitutionalization is the way in which the European Court of Justice, certainly in, in more recent years, interprets the duty of federal loyalty to translate into uh, uh, American constitutional terms, uh, the duty of loyalty, of cooperation between the member states of the European Union and the EU institutions in foreign policy. Uh, there are some judgments now which, which uh, reach uh, extremely far. I think one is uh, uh, Commission versus uh, Sweden uh, on, uh, on nominating uh, a chemical substance uh, to, to the Stockholm Convention. This is a mixed agreement, so Sweden is a full party to, to that convention together with the European Union and the other member states. Uh, and we're seeking to nominate a new chemical substance which, has, which is hazardous and uh, then, then can be listed under that convention. Um, but even that sort of very small power of uh, going to the international secretariat and uh, as a sovereign state and suggesting that a new chemical substance should be added to the, to the list was considered to be a breach of the principle of uh, loyalty, duty of cooperation, uh, because there was an, a sort of emerging European policy on these substances with which uh, Sweden interfered. And a last element of this constitutionalization process, and that takes me to the next speaker, but I'm not giving her the floor as yet, I still want mm -hmm. to say a few things, um, is the projected accession of the European Union to the European Convention on uh, Human Rights. Uh, which is, uh, I just learned uh, that the, 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 the agreement has more or less been finalized, <clears throat> the draft agreement, and um, that will of course sub fully subject the European Union in uh, all that it undertakes to uh, the scrutiny of the Convention and the Strasbourg Court, and as I understand it, this will also extend to uh, what the European, rightly so, to the U European Union's common foreign and security policy. Uh, so there will be a, a further check uh, on whether the European Union and how it acts externally uh, protects fundamental rights. Um, in just a couple of minutes to conclude, I mean, the, the thesis can be, uh, I'm sure there are countervailing, countervailing indications of this constitutionalization process uh, which some of you may develop, but um, I, I'd like to sort of in a nutshell also make a normative point and, uh, and again uh, draw on what Harold Coe said uh, yesterday much more eloquently than I'm able to do. Um, but it, it seems to me that uh, certainly within Europe um, we may be more, more sensitive to this, that these uh, traditional distinctions between uh, how a state or an entity like the European Union acts uh, on its territory internally and how it conducts its external affairs in the globalized world of the 21st century is in so many cases a distinction which makes no sense whatsoever. 
because um, what your your external is your internal, and your internal is your external. The, the world is so interconnected that it's very difficult to to draw these boundaries. And let me just give a couple of examples uh, in trade policy, which is an area I've been looking at for some time. Uh, what you see, for example, is that traditional trade policy instruments like anti-dumping and safeguard measures uh, hardly work anymore because uh, you are affecting as many of your own businesses by imposing import duties uh, with their global su supply chain because they are supplied by China as well. And uh, so you may be protecting some of, some of your domestic industries, but an, uh, another domestic industry uh, very much suffers from that. Uh, if you take counter terrorism. Uh, is it really possible in the field of counter-terrorism to talk about foreign policy, domestic policy? I mean, certainly in Europe, uh, we know that terrorism knows no borders. We haven't had attacks uh, on the scale of 9-11, but we have had many smaller attacks, and, uh, and uh, some of the terrorists are homegrown, and some come from abroad, and, or they have traveled uh, to Afghanistan and come back. Uh, if you look at issues like data protection, with which the European Union is very much concerned, again, in, in a cyber world, it's just not possible to legislate on data protection as a sovereign entity and, and, uh, and try to do anything meaningful if, uh, if there's a, a cloud here in the United States, basically, which uh, I'm, I'm, I'm reading from my Dropbox, and I, I, I guess the file is here somewhere in the US, and uh, as well as on my computer. And, uh, and anywhere else I go. Uh, climate change is another example. I mean, it's, um, uh, there was a panel on that here as well. Um, uh, international treaties and conventions, international law generally uh, increasingly has this lawmaking function, which is a, a function not just of creating obligations between states, but actually of creating obligations which need to be translated into domestic laws and which often regulate domestic issues rather than international ones. Um, so there is a, very much a case, I think, for constitutionalizing foreign policy. Um, and particularly in the European Union, uh, there is an even stronger case for this constitutionalization process uh, because the EU has what I would call a system of governance but not a government. And there is, there is really no executive uh, to which foreign policy powers have been conferred by a constitution or by a parliament and which would be accountable to that parliament and ultimately to the electorate. So we, we need even more a system of checks and balances, I think, um, which um, may be the result of uh, this constitutionalization process. I will leave it there. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel. Um, I should also like to thank the organizers uh, for this possibility to intervene in a most interesting panel. And uh, given the topic uh, that we are discussing, uh, I should say that uh, the voice from the European Court of Human Rights uh, on the issue uh, is uh, certainly uh, in place. Um, I will propose uh, uh, two teases uh, for my intervention. Uh, the first one very much follows uh, the previous speakers. Uh, and I would also say that uh, European context of foreign policy decision making is different. Um, it's uh, multi-layered and complex. And I think Andreas has uh, by now uh, showed it uh, extensively. I also agree that constitu constitutionalization and uh, judicialization are uh, the words of the game uh, in Europe. In this uh, respect, the European Court of Human Rights is an important player. And as I was listening to my colleagues, I almost was, uh, was saying to myself, all roads lead to Rome. Uh, because in the end of the day, um, also because uh, uh, indeed the uh, agreement on accession of the European Union to the European Convention on Human Rights has apparently been finalized. I just got uh, a, 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 an information on my Blackberry this morning. So um, things fall in places um, in, in Europe. Secondly, um, I will try to, to, to show to you that uh, recently European Court of Human Rights uh, has come to clarify 
the principle that European states uh, cannot uh, just abandon uh, uh, European public order principles in the name of other interests, be it dressed up as foreign policy interests or decisions, or be it as uh, a reference to the United Nations uh, Charter or its main uh, uh, aims. So in many ways, uh, indeed, my intervention echoes and builds on uh, the previous uh, speakers. I think uh, if you take a historical perspective, uh, one could have guessed uh, this development in Europe. Because once you create a regional uh, European Court of uh, Human Rights, uh, which is interested to guard, to uphold a certain set of values, legal principles, one could have expected that uh, uh, the court will be confronted with uh, disputes linked to more global decisions that uh, the states uh, have to take uh, every now and then. Uh, one has witnessed since 1999, when a full-time European Court of Human Rights was put in place uh, in Strasbourg, France, that on more and more regular basis, the court has had to decide cases closely linked to foreign policy decisions of the state's parties to the convention. I've been wondering on the reason for that. And I think the reason is, again, uh, uh, manyfold. First of all, the jurisdiction of the court has expanded compared to 1990. Now the court covers 47 states, including the Russian Federation and including the 27 European Union member states. With this expansion, the court has been uh, receiving more varied uh, problems for its adjudication. Um, it is also true that the decision making simply is faster in modern world and that we also see in the court. And uh, the third aspect is that, uh, well, it takes time, uh, practice shows, it takes time for the, for the citizens to learn of the existence of a particular legal mechanism that protects their rights, and by now there is, uh, I would say, uh, uh, a sufficient knowledge uh, across European countries of the fact that ultimately they might try uh, their chances in the European Court of Human Rights. Uh, the fact that it is uh, a uh, highly charged and an active court is probably shown by the fact that today the court renders uh, roughly uh, 1,500 judgments a year. I think that probably is the most busy court in the world. Um, <clears throat> now let me now exemplify the types of foreign policy decisions that have received the court's attention. And I should no doubt start with those cases where human rights complaints have, be, have arisen in the context of military actions and armed conflict. Now the first, one of the first leading cases of which there have been extensive discussions, uh, not only in the context of the ASIL meetings but elsewhere, was of course the decision in Bankovic against the NATO member states concerning the bombing of Belgrade in 1989. More recently, Al Jeddah against the United Kingdom was about internment for several years of uh, Iraqi born UK citizen by the British Armed Forces in Iraq. Many judgments, indeed, many judgments, are passed against Russia concerning internal armed conflict in Chechnya. There are now two interstate uh, cases, Russia Georgia, pending following the 2008 war. Um, the principles, and I could continue with the list of these, of these cases, but of course, uh, in view of the limit of, uh, of the time, let me just tell you what are the principles that the court has set in these cases. The first one is that European states may be held responsible for violations of human rights in their foreign military actions, not to mention that they are held to high human rights standards 
concerning internal conflicts. And that may solve um, a puzzle uh, for those uh, researching uh, the Chechnya uh, uh, case law and asking themselves the question, why is it that international humanitarian law references are not so present in these cases? But uh, it is evident that uh, uh, right to life and prohibition of torture uh, uh, standards applied in these cases probably go uh, beyond what would be expected as concerns humanitarian law principles applicable in internal armed conflicts. Now, um, a question could be asked uh, whether this approach might have, in a way, a cooling effect on European governments in their decisions to, be, to become involved uh, in international peacekeeping missions or in international uh, uh, armed uh, conflicts. <clears throat> the court's position uh, is clarified in cases raising a question as to the compatibility of United Nations Security Council resolutions with the European Court Convention. The court has, uh, in principle, taken the approach which is aimed at reaching the harmonious interpretation of the UN Charter and the Security Council resolutions and the European Convention on Human Rights. That is a starting point. And that indeed uh, uh, confirms uh, uh, what Andreas and Pete have just said. Uh, that the court can do it precisely because we are an international treaty, we are uh, 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 interpreting and applying an international treaty. So here we can follow uh, 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 the debate uh, that takes place in, in either in the International Law Commission or elsewhere on the principles uh, that, that should aim to avoid fragmentation of international law. And the court is very conscious of that. Um, so that is uh, the main um, approach. In al -Jeda, the court said that, and that's what makes a, a, a big difference with the approach so far in Qadi uh, case. So the court said, there must be a presumption that the Security Council does not intend to impose any obligation on member states to breach fundamental principles of human rights. You may say it's very idealistic, but that's the point of departure of the, of the human rights court. Um, recently in NADA against Switzerland, concerning the uh, United Nations Security Council sanctions, regime uh, applied against Al-Qaeda and Taliban and its supporters, where in fact the harmonization approach, uh, so far possible uh, in, in Al-Jeda, uh, could hardly help uh, the court to address the issue. The court in fact criticized Switzerland for its inaction at a foreign relations level. Now, first, because it did not encourage Italy, state of nationality of the applicant, to undertake action in the Security Council to assist the applicant against whom the sanctions were applied, so that he is delisted from uh, 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 the list. And second, the court explicitly stated that Switzerland cannot rely on a binding character of the resolution it should have persuaded the court that it had taken, or at least had attempted to take, all possible measures to adapt the sanctions regime to the applicant's individual situation. Now, this is an extremely, I would say, interesting uh, uh, development uh, as concerns the uh, proactive, if I may, um, uh, policy that the court uh, um, is arguing for as concerns the, the, the actions of the state's uh, parties. So now that clearly puts a burden on state to actively harmonize their international obligations. Where those are in conflict, the court asks that states show they have at least tried, and that's now the threshold, 
actively either at bilateral or multilateral levels to harmonize the allegedly uh, conflicting uh, obligations. The other types of cases that raise sensitive issues in either bilateral relations or in a multilateral context are the following. Cases on extradition requests. Uh, most recently, to stand terrorism charges. And here, uh, Baba Rahmad against United Kingdom is the last case uh, uh, in the line. Um, as concerns extradition cases, uh, we have uh, long established practice, and here the court really does not develop uh, uh, or clarify uh, anything new, and the principles were established in the old case law, soaring against the United Kingdom. The court has clearly said that any extradition request should be assessed in the light of Article 3, and the state concerned should see whether the person on the other side might or might not uh, face uh, uh, ill treatment. Now, why Babar Ahmed case is interesting uh, it is because, in many ways, I could even say that the United States was party to the case. Um, the whole solution to the case uh, uh, depended on uh, two aspects. First, it was the diplomatic assurances of the U.S. government, which contain very specific uh, promises as to the sentence and as to the conditions in which the applicants, if extradited, uh, will, uh, will, will face. And secondly, uh, the case also depended on the uh, statements in evidence given by uh, the, 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 uh, uh, those working at a particular prison where uh, these, these applicants uh, facing terrorism charges were likely to be placed. So, um, in that sense, uh, given that, that the, the U.S. assurances and given the evidence that was presented to the court, uh, the court could uh, make its decision on whether or not uh, the extradition uh, decision that the UK was, was going to pass would comply with, with Article 3 of the European Convention on Human Rights. Now, the next group, expulsion cases, that concerns a very delicate issue for Europe, uh, which is its immigration policy uh, or difficulties with having such a policy. Um, now, these cases, what we see, um, also show some incomplete decision making. Recently, um, following the uh, military presence in Afghanistan, also of the European forces, we see a number of cases concerning the asylum seekers from Afghanistan and the government interest to expel them. Um, and in that sense, uh, the court again plays its role in what clearly uh, the European states would have considered as the foreign policy issues. Um, just to mention another uh, example, Hirsi Yama against Italy showed uh, uh, the problem about the so-called boat people intercepted on the high seas between the Libyan coast and Lampedusa. And here the court A found that uh, it has a jurisdiction as concerns the Italian boats bringing back the, uh, the, the refugees, asylum seekers, to Libya, and three found a violation uh, against Italy for the fact that in Libya, despite their bilateral agreement, no human conditions were guaranteed to these asylum seekers. And the court very clearly said that it, it may very well be that bilateral agreement between Li Libya and Gaddafi and Italy was aimed at, at good purposes, but European Convention was not complied in the facts of the case, and bilateral agreement could not stand in the way. To conclude, <laughs> I do not list any number of other sort of types of situations which are clearly uh, uh, foreign uh, affairs uh, related, but where the court has had um, its voice. To conclude, um, European court is a factor to keep in mind where 
when European capitals plan their foreign policy steps. NADA shows that the court has imposed its requirements as to how proactive foreign policy should be in protecting human rights principles uh, and uh, protecting European uh, uh, public mm -hmm. order. This feature strongly characterizes Europe, probably sets it slightly apart, in that there is an institutional channel with binding decision in the end through which international law may be applied to limit discretion of states in decision making, especially in foreign relations. There is a common legal culture, European public order, which is contributed to and upheld by both European courts and the highest national courts. I will not pretend that um, it is always kept in mind uh, when political decisions are taken in the capitals. But there is always this chance that some aspects of a situation may come to the highest courts or the European Court of Human Rights and that they may end up uh, 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 to be addressed in a binding judgment uh, by uh, European Court of Human Rights. And as I said, the system becomes uh, falls into places with the fact that the European Union is uh, now likely to very soon accede to the European Convention on Human Rights. I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Uh, thank you all, and thank you for making my job uh, so easy. Um, uh, since you made my job so easy, I've been able to think about what you've actually been saying. Um, and so uh, let me just start us off by asking uh, just a couple of questions to each of you, um, as maybe uh, the audience can think about their questions, and then, and, and then, and then we'll take questions after perhaps the first round of response. Um, just real, real quickly, um, some of these are sort of inside the Beltway questions, other, others are more, more general. Um, the first inside the Beltway question, I guess, to Andreas is, um, everybody seems to be coining new terms. Uh, the president of the German Constitutional Court is coining the term Verfassungsgerichtsverbund, uh, um, translated roughly as a federation of constitutional courts. And my question is, uh, what's the difference between that and Verfassungsverbund, uh, federation of constitutions, which is a concept that we've had for a long time in the literature. So we're moving from a federation of the constitutions to now federations of the constitutional courts. Other than elevating the courts over everybody else, I wonder what is the what's what's the dip, as they would say. Um, the second question for you is in in um, in your speaking, it sounded like you were saying that a certain pluralism of courts is just a bad thing. It's a bad thing for citizens, um, and I wonder whether that's really true. I wonder whether it might not be a bad thing for governments because governments can be sued left and right in all sorts of different courts. For citizens, it might be great because you have lost of different courts that you can choose because it's usually the citizens that initiate the action and so they can choose well what's my best court hey I'm gonna go over here so it's the governments who don't like it but perhaps it's actually great for the citizens um, uh, my question to um, Pete uh, two questions is uh, the first one is you uh, you uh, you talk about constitutionalization I'd love to push you more on that but uh, let me let me push you just a, a small way um, on your conclusion you say the interconnectedness suggests we need more constitutionalization and of course you might say there's the exact opposite thesis, namely that the interconnectedness is actually the advent of the dissolution of constitutionalism. It's the advent of the dissolution of individual member states' constitutional controls over what's happening in the legal world. And so we actually have not constitutionalization, but beyond constitutionalism or something like that. Um, uh, on the uh, on the uh, on the uh, on the jurisdiction of of the court, you say the the jurisdiction the court is, things are being constitutionalized because the court is exercising jurisdiction over CFSP matters, and this is a little bit of an inside the beltway question. And I'm wondering, is it not perhaps the fact that all CFSP actions that so far have been reviewed by the European Court of Justice have been reviewed because they have spilled over into traditional areas of European Community action, which are traditionally within the European Court of Justice's governance. So uh, it has spilled over into European community actions, freezing accounts, CCP, common commercial policy, that's always been within the court's jurisdiction. So there isn't any sort of free-floating foreign policy jurisdiction of the European Court of Justice that, is, that has really happened yet. It's all been concrete spillovers into the traditional areas. Which brings me sort of to the final question um, to, uh, to Ineta uh, Zumela and perhaps to all the panelists. 
and that is whether the accession of the European Court of Justice, I'm sorry, ha, see, Freudian slip, the accession of the European Union to the European Convention of Human Rights, whether that might not place the European Court of Human Rights in Strasbourg in a superior position, greater jurisdiction, actually to review real foreign policy actions that have eluded the ECJ's review so far. And so the question is, is there a danger that the ECHR, the European Court of Human Rights, might actually have greater jurisdiction than the European Court of Justice? Not just as a court of additional resort, as it's been functioning with regard to the member states, but that you guys can get involved in foreign policy matters that really so far have eluded the court because they have not spilled over into uh, traditional actions of the EC. So if you would want to, you could choose to respond to that real quick. I don't see anybody at the mic yet. Um, and, then, and then we could take questions from the audience. Do you want to start? Should we just? Yeah. So in, more the, in the order in which they asked. Yeah. OK, well, thank you. I, I knew I would get some, some good questions. Um, on the terms, well, in a certain way, uh, this is a translation of the terminology of the union. Um, or the Federation of uh, Legal Orders, but it is a little bit more than that. Um, it has to do with, uh, I mean, you, you are all familiar with Anne-Marie Slaughter's uh, great articles on the community of courts, so that would be also another tr possible translation. Um, it is a translation of the uh, feder Federation, so to speak, of legal orders, but it is also more than that, uh, because the, uh, it is a question of who is the arbiter of that legal order which plays a role and there I would say we see that this clear separation of power so to speak is evaporating a little bit before our eyes and therefore there is um, an overlap not really of the legal orders but of the uh, uh, cases of the real world issues those legal orders have to deal with and that means that there are the corpor cooperative quality of the whole edifice which is actually regulated nowhere uh, is becoming more important. So actually, I would say there is an added value to the term, although I'm, of course, not the authoritative interpreter of my president. <laughs> um, secondly, um, pluralism as a bad thing for citizens. Um, it can be a bad It can be a good thing always to have another court. It is a good thing probably when you are, Caroline, uh, from Monaco or Hanover. Uh, which actually I, I, I have a great deal of sympathy for her that she actually goes this way, sees her cases through. Uh, I don't want to say anything bad about that, that's her rights, and also she does something for other people who are not in a privileged position to pay for all of these lawyers. But actually most people are not in that position. And that means that forum shopping is always good for those who can afford to, for to go to all of these fora, most people can't. Uh, and it gets very intransparent. And sometimes that's something I learned as a, as a domestic judge, if you like, that what we think is a matter of course as international and European lawyers is not a matter of course in the real world out there. It's very difficult to see through these sorts these of things uh, for, for ordinary uh, lawyers and even more so for ordinary citizens. And then um, we see increasingly that constitutional cases are not only between the citizen of the state, then usually the, the biggest uh, uh, the, the greatest protection will win, and then you can use all, all the, these orders. But you, the very often we have press freedom versus privacy. It's not the press freedom of Caroline, which was at stake. It is a press freedom of uh, the newspapers and of the blogging world, uh, the blogosphere, which is uh, uh, at stake. And therefore, and these balancings uh, are not as determinate as probably are the state individual cases and their different uh, uh, fora will always get and even in the same jurisdiction different courts will come to different conclusions and the question is who is the one who sorts this out so that in fact leads a little bit back to the first question yes I would see it as a would say it is a problem for ordinary citizens too if I may say something on the other questions too I'm, I must, uh, I add, so to speak, to the question to Pete, uh, constitutionalization. Uh, is it not in the matter, in the sphere of foreign policy, at least, only, uh, but at least, I mean, judicialization we are talking about, uh, rather than constitutionalization of the whole edifice. Um, of course, the domestic constitutional judge is always a little bit uh, um, cautious to extend the word constitution to other legal orders. But I hasten to add what cannot and must not be forgotten, and that was what all my talk was a little bit about, is that 
the constitutional guarantees should not lose their force when you transfer a competence to an international institution. And that, I think, is very valid. And that's why, um, on balance, the accession uh, of the Europe, to, the European Court, uh, to the European Convention of Human Rights of the European Union is a good thing. And uh, even if one does not has to sh have to share the optimism of uh, Inita on this, I hope I would be able to share the optimism and think it should be it should happen and it should happen rather soon. Okay. Thank you. Yes, on the first question, whether the interconnectedness doesn't uh, actually involve the solution of uh, constitutionalization, constitutionalism, it depends on, I guess, which which uh, versions of constitutionalism you embrace. If you see. Uh, con constitutions of sovereign states in a very idiosyncratic way as uh, different each from each other and and then of course the globalized world un undermines uh, the capacity uh, of each sovereign state to uphold their uh, their own version of their own particular constitution but if you look at constitutionalism more from a cosmopolitan perspective um, and I think that is the perspective which I would em embrace as, you know, there are quite a number of shared values in, in Western type uh, constitutions which have basically grown out of the response to the Second World War and, and also international cooperation. Uh, I don't think that the, uh, the uh, interconnectedness uh, resulting from globalization means that we have to give up on constitutionalism. That would be my sort of immediate response to a hard question. Um, your second question, the jurisdiction of the European Court of Justice. I know that um, in foreign policy matters, the, if you look at the treaties and the, the standard uh, approach of most EU lawyers is to say the European Court of Justice has no jurisdiction over the common foreign and security policy uh, with two exceptions uh, as it now is specified by the Lisbon Treaty. Uh, so it looks like an exceptional case, namely restrictive measures against individuals and uh, questions of overlap or interference of, uh, as you pointed out, foreign policy decisions with other areas of EU external action. Uh, I think both actually are not exceptions, are extremely significant heads of jurisdiction and will, I think, in future show themselves to be such uh, uh, very important heads of jurisdiction. If I may link it to the, to, to your the last question of accession to the European Convention and that the Court of Human Rights would have the broadest jurisdiction. Uh, my guess is that the European Court of Justice will not, in matters of CFSP, tolerate that in the sense that they will construe their own jurisdiction uh, as broadly as the jurisdiction of Strasbourg and in fact would need to do that uh, from a perspective of European Union law. So what do I mean by that? Uh, whenever there is a human rights issue connected to uh, the common foreign and security policy, which may go up to Strasbourg, uh, I think the court will just consider that these are restrictive measures against individuals and, and that there is a jurisdiction. Uh, and the other type is really a constitutional one of exercise of powers of the institution. So, so I think it's a, it's a much broader jurisdiction than many people are now conceive of it. Mm -hmm. Yes, to, to continue and uh, respond to your last question, um, I agree with, with Pete that uh, the accession to the European Convention on Human Rights will have its, um, what should I say, uh, motivating element, disciplining element uh, as concerns uh, also the European Union and the questions of uh, jurisdiction that will be decided by the Luxembourg court. Um, so in that respect, um, I would say in a formal sense, um, there is no question that uh, the, the, the scope of, of jurisdiction, even just, just formally looking you know, at, at the draft agreement and its implications, that the jurisdiction will, uh, will grow. It will be uh, the whole area which is not now subject to the court's uh, scrutiny in Strasbourg, uh, which are the supranational decisions taken by the EU institutions, mm -hmm. um, sort of all of them. Mm -hmm. And I would say to the extent that these decisions uh, are justiciable, uh, one way or the other, they, they might, might come indeed to the European Court of Human Rights if there is any, any human rights aspect in it. And if you look, what is interesting now to reflect on is to see those areas under EU law 
where you already see that there's actually an inherent problem <laughs> in terms of human rights law and uh, that, that would generate a certain influx of, of, of cases. Not that the European Court of Human Rights needs more uh, influx, but uh, there we are. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, more substantively, um, I think once uh, the European Court of Human Rights has, in fact, identified uh, its place notably through the cases that I mentioned, Al Jeddah and Nada, because it was also a very, these were very important cases, not, not necessarily for the applicants or the states, but these are very important cases for the court itself, because it was these cases that allowed the court to find its place hmm, as one of the actors uh, in international legal system as such. So and once the court has said that uh, we will uphold, once we have a problem in front of us, we will uphold the European public order even uh, where uh, uh, actions of the states outside Europe are concerned, based on certain criteria of course for jurisdiction, um, which was not an obvious decision to take by the court. But once the court has come to that, um, I think, well, that will all apply also to the uh, European mm -hmm. Union mm -hmm. sort of possible issues that will stem in that context. Great. Um, yes, I have two questions. Go ahead. Good morning. Uh, my name is Juan Antonio Yanez. I am a retired ambassador of Spain and a member of the Permanent Court of Arbitration. And I'm very glad that the panel has covered all the complexity of Europe's system of governance with at, at least three layers, states, uh, European Union, and Council of Europe. And that we will now left aside the sub-national uh, level, which is very important in some countries, including mine. Uh, <laughs> But uh, I would like, if you permit me, to uh, draw away the debate which has focused uh, a lot, perhaps too much, on uh, the, the actions and views of courts, and they are very important. But the, uh, the theme of our panel was the EU as a global actor in a multipolar world. Of course, this is very wide. Uh, but I would like to take one strand of, of what some of you have touched upon, and that is the question of uh, counterterrorism. Uh, and as we are sitting now uh, in Washington, D.C., uh, I would like to get your views about the interaction between the United States, especially under the previous administration, and uh, Europe, as a whole, countries, European Union, Council of Europe, and not only courts, but also uh, uh, governments, public opinion, parliaments, European Parliament, uh, Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe. To what an extent you feel that European countries or certain countries closed their eyes or even were uh, accomplices in lawless uh, activities of the so-called global war on terror, and how the reaction of the European public translated through national parliaments, European Parliament, as a Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe, and others, and finally also in the courts with the Masri case recently, why all of this came to have a certain influence on the United States to change their ways. Thank you. Okay, they, we're not going to be able to address all that in five in the five minutes we have left. Uh, mm -hmm. So uh, let's also just uh, gather the questions of the of, of the uh, folks who are standing there to ask a question, and then we'll have a final round. Yes, and my name. Please is, keep your questions brief. Yes. Thank you. What my name is. You are. Thank you. My name is Cornelia Weiss, and I'm. Uh, I'd like to find out if there's any dialogue between the European Court of Human Rights and the Inter American Court of Human Rights. Uh, because uh, recently uh, there was a crisis with the Commission, uh, the Inter-American uh, Commission of Human Rights, and if there is a dialogue, I'd like to know what that is and if you can actually help with that globalization. Thank you. Thank you. 
I wanted to make a quick announcement. Just remember at 1030 for the CLE, because we have to transition the scanners that at the time the session ends that you need to scan out. So, because they won't be able to stand there and when the next session starts. Sorry. Thank you. My name is Ravneet Kaur. I'm from the Attorney General's of Singapore, but my, the question is my own and not my country's. Um, I was just in uh, New York two weeks ago, uh, involved in the negotiations for the Arms Trade Treaty, where the EU was pushing for full membership of RIOs, or Regional Integrated Organization. And to the credit of the EU, when it was quite clear that, that um, if it pushed too hard, it would block, it, it would be difficult to get consensus, the EU did back off. But um, arising from that, I have two questions. Firstly, um, in pushing for RIOs in different treaties and conventions, um, how does how does how does the EU consider this? Um, considering that every EU member um, already has the capacity of being a member in the treaty and convention, what is the purpose of becoming an additional the EU becoming an additional member to the treaty and convention? <coughs> and uh, the second question. Rising from this I'm, is I'm sorry, ma'am. We, we, we have three. We have two and a half minutes left. I think we're going to have to yes, leave it's, it at it's one, a related, one question. It's, it's we have to leave it at one question, ma'am. I'm sorry. We have two people behind you. Mm -hmm. We have okay. two and a half minutes it's, left. It's really is a related question. Fifteen okay. seconds. Basically, um, is it not a valid concern that the increase of uh, this might increase uh, states trying to become members of different RIOs and trying to join uh, get RIOs to join as well? Thank you. My name is Katarina Kumar Perry of Kumar Eco Consult. I'm a national of uh, one of the very small minority of European countries that are, that are not members of the European Union, but never, nevertheless subject to the European uh, Court of Human Rights, as we have heard. My question is very much in line with the, uh, the first question posed. In light of all, all of what uh, you have said, how does that affect uh, the uh, balance between the European Union as a power, as opposed to the United States, as opposed to emerging economies? Is the European Union or the countries moving closer together or further apart, also in light of the current financial crisis? Thank you. Great, thank you. Good morning. My, my name is Augusto Hernandez. I came from South America. Uh, the, the topic of the European Union is always a relevant matter in international relations, international law. My question is about the, 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 the elimination of the uh, European Commission of Human Rights in, uh, in 1999. Uh, I would like to know the, the evaluation of uh, uh, Mrs. Simele, uh, in relation of the Inter-American Commission of Human Rights, it could be, it could, it, it can be uh, eliminated the the same in the same way as as Europe or uh, in the Inter-American system. There are um, different practical problems. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, we have a minute and a half left, but so let's give let's give each speaker one minute. Uh, I won't need it. I just uh, would like to address the terrorism question and just point out that there is a great agreement actually between all European actors and in particular courts that uh, the so-called uh, fight or whatever you call it against terrorism cannot, cannot be successful at the expense of individual and human and fundamental rights. And uh, I think uh, this is a very distinctive European approach. Uh, I would uh, continue on that, and this is precisely why the role of the courts is so important to, to, keep, to keep the gates, to keep the gates, and which explains why there is El Masri against Macedonia decision in the European Court of Human Rights and other cases pending. Because if this, this principle, which is part of the European sort of uh, thinking and European worldview, if there are no safeguards to maintain uh, approach that human rights uh, should be respected, whatever the decision is, uh, then, uh, well, then we don't know where we are going. And finally, uh, just to pick on the inter-American uh, system of human rights, yes, there is uh, a regular dialogue and there have been mutual visits uh, back and forth between uh, Strasbourg and, and San Jose. Um, and, uh, and I think mutual sort of exchange on working methods and, and, and problems and, and solutions. Yes, yes, that's, that's ongoing. And, and the commission, could you just address? No, that, that I will, will not address. I, I, it's, uh, it's a huge topic. <laughs> I could give you a lecture on that. <laughs> um, 
I think I just want to say something about the question uh, of EU membership of uh, international organizations. Um, I mean, this is really the one major gap in the EU as an international actor from a formal legal perspective because the European Union is fully recognized to be able to conclude international treaties and conventions in so many different spheres of action and and uh, no other international actors denied that capacity to the European Union um, but with that exercise of, int of international lawmaking, treaty making, goes a desire of course to be also a full member of the organizations which are in which these treaties and conventions are embedded simply to be able to uh, properly exercise the powers which the European Union uh, has. Uh, I personally don't think there's any great danger that there will be too many other states which will try to sort of enhance their role in international organizations by following the same path. I, I still see the European Union as quite unique in that sense. But it is a, a big uh, defect in, uh, or gap in, in how the EU can act externally still today. Wonderful. Thank you very much and thank you for the questions. By the way, as you know, my constitutional president is a complete devil's advocate. I am yeah, 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 completely yeah, yeah. I know, I know. 